Good evening and welcome to Legal Tech Live episode 102. I'm here with my friend Kristen Hodgins. Welcome to the show, Kristen. Really happy to have you. Hi, Nick. I'm glad to be on it. I'm glad to have you on it. And we've talked about doing this for quite some time. I've talked about her being a guest host with me. And uh, and then somebody, Daniel Holdley, uh, had mentioned having Kristen on the show and just letting her talk for like an hour. <laughs> this was a Twitter conversation. It was generally, that was the statement. And, uh, and so I thought, yeah, okay, we're coming off a hiatus and I'm going to do that. But Kristen Hodgins is legal. She is, she leads organizational strategy, transformation, and service design projects in the legal and justice sectors. She helps organizations and legal departments think about problems holistically and how they can be, how they can more effectively and creatively leverage internal people knowledge, data, and technology to deliver more efficient, responsive, and innovative services. That's really well written, Chris, and I have to give that to you. She is the project manager and legal, uh, project manager for legal innovation at Osler, Hoskin, and Harcourt LLP, uh, and she's got quite the extensive uh, background in uh, government, as well as being a law librarian. And uh, she's got like a dozen master's degrees, as at least that's how I always say it, but it's <laughs> not entirely entirely accurate. I have one. Kristen, no, oh, it's one? Oh, I thought there was more. I was certain there were more, but one is more than I've got. So Kristen, thanks for being here. Uh, and uh, I really just, uh, you've got so much experience not from the practice level, which you and I joke about from time to time, discuss from time to time. Give us your kind of broad view of legal tech from your career, your background. So to put it in context, um, I've been a buyer of legal technology my entire career. I started out as a law librarian. And so I bought databases like Lexis and Westlaw and other research tools. Um, and then I've moved into more um, operations and service design and more recently innovation. So I'm definitely not a lawyer. I've never practiced. So I don't have that kind of firsthand on the ground practice of law, being in a courtroom, closing a deal experience. But um, as a librarian, you have a pretty good sense of what goes on in an organization. You're often one of the most connected people because you talk to pretty much every single practice group. And so you get a really interesting sense of what they need. But unlike lawyers who might be in a central group, you also tend to talk to people like paralegals and legal assistants and the actual IT group. So yeah, you get a very different uh, perspective doing that. And I guess that would be the holistic experience you talk about. You're dealing with a wide variety of users of technology. You are. And I think we often underestimate how much uh, psychology plays a role in technology, especially um, user experience and user behavior. And it's one thing for a technology to solve a problem, but it's another thing for a user to actually want to use it. And those are two very different things. Mm -hmm. And so what are some, like, you've worked both in uh, the library, you've worked in government, and you've worked in law firms, and what do you think are some kind of general takeaways from user experience or, or onboarding users to using legal technology? Yeah, I think my experience is legal tech companies, particularly the smaller ones and newer ones, they spend a lot of time developing their products and going in for that deal. Um, but once they close the sale, they pull back and the sale is only the beginning of that relationship. You have to onboard the users, you have to get them comfortable with the product, you have to get them using it, and you have to get them liking it. Because at some point, assuming it's a service that you're purchasing, there's going to be a renewal. And although, you know, the innovation or knowledge managers or the technology group um, might be in charge of the purchasing, it's really the feedback from the end users that will determine whether or not that product is renewed. That's uh, it's excellent uh, advice. We've, we've had several uh, buyers from big law on who have recommended the same and, 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 it, and it's a common, common thing in, uh, in selling, right? That it's cheaper to keep 
the existing user than to go out and get a new user. So that that is an interesting, how have you seen, it's interesting to see uh, from your side, from the buy side, how that works. And can, can you give any examples without giving away the companies of somebody you think that you've seen them do this really well? Uh, and, and some examples of how other legal tech companies or startups may be able to do that. Sure. So I'm working with this company right now. Um, it's in, I would say, the general document management space. Um, okay. And we were looking at acquiring their technology, but we really weren't sure whether we could commit to rolling it out enterprise wide. And it only made sense to purchase it if you can roll it out enterprise wide. And we weren't really sure if users were gonna use it and if it was really gonna solve our problem. So we worked with them to develop a pilot. So it's a small investment of money and a relatively small investment of time. Um, you know, we test it on our test machines and then we have a pilot group of users who use the product. They go through the training with the vendor we collect feedback from them and you know we do that over about a six week period and after that six weeks we have a pretty good sense of whether or not we actually want to purchase that product but you know some things that have impressed me about them is they have a project manager on staff so me as a project manager on the client side i can liaise with them and you know they develop the project plan and i just tweaked it um, they have training materials they have you know, they've thought about change management and communication. So it just shows me that they're really concerned um, about the end user and ensuring that, um, you know, we set them up for success. That's very cool. And what type of test users in the firm were, were uh, working on this? Who were, who were using it? Was it lawyers? Was it paralegals? Uh, support staff? Who, who was using this? Yeah, this, so... Uh, um, it's primarily lawyers and legal assistants. Um, so we, in our pilot group, we took, um, you know, lawyers who are very techno technologically savvy. We took lawyers who are very skeptical about technology. We took lawyers from different practice groups and we took a variety of legal assistants as well because we really wanted to get that kind of overall picture of whether or not this would actually work for everyone. Mm -hmm. That's very, uh, very good. I do want to, uh, for those who are joining us over on Facebook, uh, Diego says hello. And uh, for those who weren't here at the very beginning, we're talking tonight with Kristen Hodgins. She is a project manager uh, of legal innovation at Osler, Osler Hoskins in Harcourt. Is that correct? Osler, but yes. Osler, thank you. Uh, and we also have uh, Nicola Shaver, Chris Congero. Christian Saad and Amanda Brown joining us here in the Zoom room. So if you have questions either on Facebook or on Zoom, please let us know. So that's one of the good examples of, of onboarding. You've been impressed with the way that this, this team has, has onboarded users. Have you had bad experiences that uh, legal technology companies or startups can learn from uh, so that you can you share some bad experiences so they can learn from that? Yeah, I've had a few. Uh, I think you can put it into a couple of different buckets. It's when the person who's trying to sell you the technology isn't actually all that familiar with the technology. Um, the people I work with are quite technologically savvy and they are going to ask technical questions about deployment, about security. And someone on the call really needs to be able to answer that because if they can't, then we have to set up another meeting to talk about that aspect of it. Um, and especially if we have lawyers on the call, it's not really a good use of their time. Um, also vendors that stop being responsive after the contract is signed and the software is deployed. Um, you know, again, yes, we've paid the money, but probably not going to renew for the next year. Um, and then also vendors who are developing a newer product and it's buggy as new products often are, but aren't really responsive to taking feedback or making changes to resolve some of those issues. So a lot of those are really uh, customer service concerns in, in large part, right? Uh, and customer communication. Uh, that that's interesting. Uh, I, I can't imagine a company wanting to sign up and then disappear when the renewal could be uh, valuable to them. The other one that I found interesting in your example there, it was the the it was the second one you just gave, and it just escaped me literally as I was asking you the question about it. it was the second example? Uh, oh, the or maybe it was the first example. It was more like, hey, we've got the salesperson 
and we brought more people on board, but they're not technical enough to really answer all the questions. That's an interesting aspect with selling technology. Maybe the sales development rep is not the appropriate person to be making the sale if they're not comfortable with the technology themselves. Yeah, I mean, it's a tough balance to strike because sales is, um, you know, a whole area of work and people spend their whole lives in sales and in different industries and they're quite successful at it. But yeah, I think to, especially with this particular audience, with the legal industry, with lawyers who are going to go into the weeds and they are going to ask those questions early on, I think that should just be anticipated. That's good. That's good advice or good suggestions. Uh what is the, what are the kind of, is there anything stand out in your experience, Kristen, that was just a horrendous onboarding experience without, uh, without naming <laughs> names, of course. It's one of the, uh, the larger uh, legal publishers out there. Um, yeah, they were rolling out a new version of their research platform and okay you know, the, the start date of that rollout kept getting delayed, delayed, delayed. And then one day they just flipped the switch. And of course, all of our users who have probably spent five or six years working with this particular interface, suddenly faced with a brand new one, you know, couldn't find cases, you're in court the next day, you are looking for something. And it was just an absolute nightmare. They didn't have training. And it was just like a textbook example of how not to roll out a new version of something. So my experience with this has been the Salesforce lightning experience. Uh, but the nice thing about the way Salesforce has done that uh, is, is that they allowed you to still use your classic interface it, rather than just automatically move you over to the new interface. So that, that would be, uh, I think, a m more appropriate way to deal with something like that, especially if uh, you've got users who are in time, time sensitive uh, industries, like I have to be in trial tomorrow. For the sales process, since you have been a buyer, what do you like to see? What are some suggestions to those? Because we, are, our audience is predominantly developers in legal technology, startups, startup founders. What do you like to see if they're making the call to you or if they're reaching out to you? Um, I want to see that they've actually given some thought as to whether I'm the appropriate person to talk to, first of all. Um, depending on the technology, I might not be. Um, you know, and if I am going to set up a meeting with them and talk to them and sit through a demo, um, I want that demo to not just be kind of here's what our product does, but I want it to go a bit deeper and try to guess at some of the issues that we're likely facing. Most law firms um, face the same issue. So, you know, you can talk to one and ask them. It's probably the same across the board, but just give some thought to how this is actually going to make life easier for users or make them more money or do something else. Because surely we're looking at that technology because we either see an opportunity or we have a problem to solve. Um, and as I mentioned before, just having clear documentation, having um, an onboarding, a rollout plan, you know, who's gonna train the users, um, what level of you know, IT support is there going to be, just those kind of really basic things. And then giving some thought as to um, change champions, if you will. I know we talked about this on our Clubhouse chat the other day, but um, one of the things that I struggle with is you know, identifying those people internally who will adopt the technology and will be those champions for the technology to sell it to the rest of the firm. Um, sometimes it's really helpful if the company can start framing it as a we issue. So we want to make this technology a success in your firm. How do we do that? So it's kind of putting us both on the same side of the issue rather than having that, I don't want to say adversarial, but a bit more adversarial relationship with a vendor. And, you know, even them just asking, okay, who in your organization can be a change champion for this? Because even though we know to think of that, sometimes we don't always. And just being reminded of that is really helpful. That is, uh, so So you're saying from the vendor asking who in your organization would be the, the change champion for uh, sort of the advocate for this technology, essentially? Yeah, and working together on a plan to get them on board, um, get them comfortable with it, um, getting them convinced that it's actually good. Because 
if I'm looking at bringing a technology in, I want it to succeed just as much as the vendor does because I'm going to look pretty bad if I've spent a lot of money on a technology and it turns out, you know, five people have used it when we bought it for a hundred. Right. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So, so uh, for those of you out there selling to law firms, think about how you can make the buyer look good as well. And uh, the, the actual procurement person look good because that's going to be helpful to you in the future, especially when you come back with the, the upsell or the additional service that you offer. I'm sure that is uh, something to be, to be thought about uh, at the time that they're making the original purchase. Because I'm assuming that you might, as you did with the pilot program, we're testing this much for this small amount of price or this kind of reasonable price, but we may be making a much bigger purchase. And after that, there are other bells and whistles that you have that we might be interested in. So they should be thinking about that uh, long-term relationship, it sounds like. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, and Nicola, uh, Nicola Shaver says, or set up a call ahead of time to find out what the use cases are that you are trying, uh, trying to be so they can get clear, I'm sorry, uh, get clear demos uh, and roll out to that use case. Is that what you were saying, uh, Nicola? Yeah, uh, I think having a quick call with the vendor beforehand, just so that they understand our particular issues, and then they can target that demo accordingly. And that's, that's excellent great. advice. Yeah, that's great advice. Uh, so you have a, a wide variety of opinions on legal tech as well. <laughs> I have thoughts. You have thoughts. So I, I'd like to get into that. So, <laughs> so Kristen's wearing a leather jacket tonight because every guest has some sort of genre that inspires. I, I've got an hour between the time I get off a day job and then I start uh, doing the show in the evenings and uh, music fills that time. And each guest inspires different uh, music. Kristen inspired heavy metal tonight. That's why the leather jacket's here. I think that's worth saying. Kristen, you've got a lot of opinions on how to improve legal technology, not only from uh, not only from the buy side, but just in general. What do you see uh, from your career that you think really needs to be tackled? Maybe it's not by the startups, but maybe just in legal technology generally. Yeah, and I think this advice isn't just about legal tech, but it's about any kind of large scale project or transformation. Um, it's, there's a few things. There's one, having a plan for it. Um, you know, every change is a project. So plan for that project, except you can't plan all the way for a lot of these changes. So leave some room for chaos in there, but really think about how this change is going to impact people. Every innovation, require someone somewhere doing something differently. And if it's a large innovation, if it's a big technology rollout, if it's a restructuring, that's probably going to involve a lot of people doing a lot of things differently. And we don't always spend enough time thinking about their behavior and how that makes them feel. Um, you know, when people are resistant to change, and it's not because they hate change, it's because they have reasonable fears about what the outcome is going to be. Um, you know, we need to spend more time actually thinking about that and communicating with them and at times consulting with them on that change. And that applies to technology too. Um, and it's not that lawyers are scared of technology. It's that most lawyers that I know, they have extremely busy practices and, you know, they rely very heavily on the technology that they have to do their work. And if we're going to change something, well, if it doesn't work right, that might impact their clients, that might impact their billing targets. So I think just really thinking about, it's not a matter of, oh yeah, you just need to learn this new interface. It's simple. It's like, what is the actual um, you know, change that that user has to go through and how are you going to make it as easy as possible for them? And we've found this um, multiple times in, in speaking with some others uh, who are buying in big law firms uh, in the last part of last year, we, we found that the single use kind of or standalone solutions seem to be problematic uh, at law firms. If it's not in there in a lawyer or paralegal or somebody's existing workflow or the products that they're already using, Microsoft Word, their document management systems, that type of stuff, Word, Outlook, then, then the adoption seems to be much more difficult. Is that what you found as well? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, it's not just single use, but I think it's also 
who's actually using the product. We talk so much about lawyers, um, but we don't talk very much about paralegals or legal assistants. And in many practices, particularly very high transactional practices, litigation, paralegals play a massive, massive role. And they're probably far more likely to be the end users of that technology than the lawyers themselves. But yet we don't really talk to them enough. And you know, we don't invite them to conferences to get their thoughts, even though they're just as valuable, if not more than the lawyers at the firm. Yeah, that's interesting. And I know that that's been uh, kind of a, a discussion, point of discussion that we've had before. Uh, because I don't see any products being targeted, or I have not seen specific uh, that they're targeting the paralegal. Do you think there are products that haven't been created that need to be created for the paralegal, or are there ones that they should be not trying to sell to the law firm as uh, as the lawyers as an end user, but to the paralegals as an end user? I don't know if there are products that need to be developed that haven't been and if there were I would probably try to develop them and make some money off of it Um, but I think it's just they haven't talked to that particular demographic and I think when we talk about end users and renewing those subscriptions you might actually have more uptake if you can actually bring the paralegals and legal assistants into the room Um, they can also be quite persuasive and encourage their lawyers to use it and uh, legal assistants often become trainers of technology by default so, you know, if a lawyer doesn't know how to do something and, you know, maybe it's after hours, IT is not available, or their legal assistant is just next door, they're going to ask them how to use this technology. And so I think we need to give more thought into the kind of holistic ecosystem of the law firm or other legal organizations and how technology plays a role in that. Do you have any ideas on how we, we improve the outreach to that particular, the paralegals, the legal assistants? Because they are certainly, and we've seen this, we've seen this a lot. Uh, it's been maybe less so recently, but a lot of times we'll talk about non-lawyers and conferences. We'll talk about the non-lawyers, and and there was a you know there's been movement to say you know staff rather or you know legal professionals because paralegals are legal professionals, uh, or paraprofessionals I guess would would be the the designation, but it's still, they're part of the legal support staff and in the legal industry. How do we, how do we target this particular subset of uh, staff and users to, to sell to them and to make their lives easier? Yeah, I think it's on both the firm or the organization and the vendor to think about all of the people in the organization. What we're actually seeing is sometimes pressure from clients because in large companies, people are used to working in cross-functional teams. Like it's just normal. It's not just a bunch of lawyers working together and they're starting to really expect that of their law firm. So I think once you start taking that team-based approach to delivering legal services, it starts to become a bit more natural to include those other people in there. People like marketing, like IT, like knowledge management, you know, like finance, um, all of them have insight that is probably not being captured right now. And I also think that you provide um, a better service to your clients because when you have all of those people in the room and they're all listening to the problem at the same time and they're hearing it from the client's perspective, each of those people, given their backgrounds and experiences, they're going to take away something very differently than what a lawyer is. And Lawyers are trained to look for certain things and to frame things in a legal context, whereas other people aren't. And that's actually a big advantage. Very big advantage. Very big advantage. Uh, I, I always make the joke that my dad used to tell me that if you can, if you go to practice and you can be the lawyer who gets the deal done rather than the lawyer who looks for everything that's wrong with the deal, it'd be a huge advantage to your client. So being a little bit more willing to take risk. Uh, Ashley Pepitone says, maybe just asking the decision maker to invite a top tier paralegal to the demo could be uh, actually very useful. And I think that's a great suggestion. Um, you Have you made a push within your organization or within other organizations uh, to bring more of the support staff into these types of decisions? Um, I have, so certainly at my previous place of employment, which was in the public sector, um, 
they were still using the word non-lawyer uh, when I started and me being a law librarian and, you know, professional in my own right. And I have maybe one year less of schooling than a lawyer, but, mm -hmm. you know, seasoned professional uh, and being called non-lawyer all the time. And so, you know, that was about a three-year battle to try to get that language changed. But I eventually did. Um, one of the things I did was I led a organizational redesign project and fundamentally looked at how legal services were being delivered across the public sector. And we've developed a much more paralegal centric model because they're cheaper. And a lot of the work that's being done, particularly um, in litigation and whatnot can actually be done by a paralegal. They are far better suited to be doing some of that work and they're cheaper. And clients often like dealing with the paralegals a lot more than lawyers, they're more responsive. Um, you know, they are, they will write a short email rather than a three or four page email. So yeah, I, I've tried to do that as much as possible. And just given my background and that I'm not a lawyer and, you know, maybe I have a chip on my shoulder about that. I don't know, but um, you know, just being very conscious of who's actually the backbone of an organization and the role that they play and their importance. And Ashley mentions, Ashley Pepitone mentions, my paralegal taught me everything I know about actually practicing law. Yeah. Uh, and that is a common refrain that I've heard from lawyers. Uh, please, folks, if you've got questions for Kristen, go ahead and bring them in. Uh, we've uh, we've been talking for about 25 minutes here. And, and, and Daniel Holdley said, just let you talk for an hour. I don't know that I want to, Kristen. No, it's a terrible idea for, for everyone involved. <laughs> Where do you see, what are some of the things you'd like to see take place? We're in legal technology. It's how we met. It's how we became friends. Or that was the, you know, the, where we, we started, we were hanging out in the same areas anyway uh, of legal technology. Where would you like to see some advances in legal technology that you haven't seen recently? I don't know about advances, but what we're starting to see is a maturation of the legal technology industry and what it contains. You know, we're not just talking about innovation as a buzzword anymore. People are actually creating technologies. I think, you know, it kind of reaches the critical mass when everyday lawyers are starting to talk about legal technology, and they are. Um, I think what we're going to see more and what we need to see more of in the future is this actually distinguishing different kinds of legal technology and different markets. The legal technology that we talk about when we're talking about access to justice or consumer technology is very different from enterprise technology. Mm -hmm. When you're dealing with individuals, uh, you're far more likely to be mediating relationships between that individual and the state. And so that technology and those needs are vastly different than if you're dealing with a national law firm. So I think just starting to differentiate those and not lump it all into just legal tech and let everyone talk about legal tech as though it's all one thing. It's a very heterogeneous um, area. Yeah, and I think that's a fair, uh, last year we tried to do a lot more access to justice technology on here because I, there's a lot of great projects. Amanda Browns, for example, was one of those great projects or several, she's done several really great projects with just chatbot based type uh, technology to assist folks. And yeah, there they are different technologies. Uh, and, and I think but a lot of these, are, there's value in all of them, but the, who you're serving is different. And, and I think this goes to your paralegal, uh, your kind of push to, to bring more paralegals and, and legal support staff into the conversation is because in a lot of those consumer-based experiences, and this is where I have the uh, issues with some of the regulations, is that you may just need somebody who is in a paralegal or legal assistant type of position to assist you with this, I'm interacting with the state or I'm interacting with uh, a past significant other. Uh, and some of that doesn't require the bespoke lawyer experience. No, and another thing I'd like to see more of is an appreciation that there's a lot of legal tech out there that is appropriately specialized to law. Um, you know, litigation has no analogy anywhere else, but there's actually a lot of general technology out there that other industries use. And law is, for whatever reason, reticent to look at it because it's not legal tech and it's not for law firms. But 
a lot of the functions, especially in the back end of law firms, they're the same across industries, right? Like you need an HR system, you need a billing system, you need file management. Um, that's may or may not differ between industries. So I think, you know, a little bit more reaching across the aisle, if you will, um, yeah. would probably go a long way. And it, 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 we, were, we were having this discussion with somebody else uh, not too long ago that uh, like the business models are not significantly different yeah you're serving a different but we're talking a lot most of the times about some sort of a SaaS product and that is similar across product you know across verticals yeah and now that we have you know the big four consulting firms and others starting to come into the legal services market and they're very familiar with the other industries and the other technologies out there I think law firms are going to be caught on their back foot if they don't start you know learning a bit more about what else is out there. Yeah. yeah Cause you're, you're, you may need just a Zen desk or uh, something like that to help with your, your HR uh, or uh, uh, you know, the practice management software may be appropriate for, for your firm. And if you're not using it, it's just really going to be problematic for you. Uh, I mean, that's, that's like the, that's like, for me, that's like, 101 the practice management is your crm for your law firm if you're not using these technologies it's really it's baffling to me to see uh to see firms still doing that uh and joe ott mentions and technologies used in other industries not using law text extraction uh and, and general purpose uh i'm sorry joe you cut off there so please re repeat that but text extraction and joe uses aws and things like mm -hmm. that in his practice on a regular basis he's he is tech savvy lawyer um but yeah i think you're that's a fair assumption to to think that uh, lawyers could be caught on the back uh, uh, a general purpose crm is what he was saying mm -hmm. uh because yeah there's no reason you can't use a general purpose crm uh, in a law firm um what would you like to change personal on a personal level would you like to change about law legal technology oh. our industry yeah and so this is just a personal opinion i'm not representing any former or future employers in this um but i would very much like to see government at the table um, as i mentioned earlier especially with the consumer technology a lot of legal tech is actually trying to solve for a usability issue or um, just an obtuse design from government and I think if government came to the table more, if they, you know, were involved in some of these discussions, if they showed up more, um, I think they might learn a little bit more about users and about some of the issues. And often it's not that government doesn't care. It's just, you know, sometimes you maybe you have two people who are, for instance, responsible for publishing legislation and um, in all of their duties, they haven't actually thought all that much about user experience because they're not trained in it. But I think if they, heard a bit more about it, I think we would see a little bit more change there. The other thing I would suggest is for those startups who are designing technologies, for instance, assistance with filling out court forms or you know, residential tenancy complaints, reach out to government because some of them are becoming a lot more innovative and have programs to work with small technology companies. And they may be very willing to work with you to collaboratively solve the issue, perhaps using your technology. You got an, oh God, yes, from Amanda on your comment about uh, bringing government in or, or helping them come to the table. Uh, and Ashley mentions, uh, this may be a difference between Canada where you're located and the US where we're located, because Ashley says, yes, how do we get them to talk to us though? Uh, and which is, would have been my, my response to that. I'm like, sure, I'd love to have government come, but how do we get anything done with them? Uh, so there may be a difference. Uh, and Joe says courts need this so bad. Uh, so there may be, there may be differences, in, <laughs> differences in, in uh, jurisdictions here. Uh, Christian asks, do you provide a specific list of components to be reviewed by your test test users, or do you ask for general feedback on their user experience of the product tested? Yeah, so it depends on the product. Um, usually there are a number of qualitative and quantitative um, evaluation criteria that we're looking for. So 
on a technical side, you know, does it do the things we want it to do? Um, you know, are users able to accomplish their tasks, et cetera. Um, but we also look at things like, how does it make you feel? Like, does it actually, I, I call it the butt clench problem. Like, you know, when you're on a piece of technology and you are very frustrated, you are either getting zero results or the thing is not doing what you want it to do. And you just go, Arr! Um, we want to know that from users. So we try to get that kind of feedback also. That's great. And please, with the questions, uh, keep them coming. Ashley asks, uh, you know, thank you for the question, Christian. That's great. And uh, Ashley said, fine, how do I get the Canadian government to talk to me? <laughs> uh, and that's fair, too. Uh, and I told her to contact Kristen. And it's just silly at this point in legal technology that that Ashley is not on Twitter with the rest of us. She's been, I've told her many times. Um, the thing I will say about government is when we talk about government, we think of this kind of like one ominous um, monolithic. monolithic state. And right. government is really just a collection of individual people who most of them are, you know, trying to do a good job at the end of the day. And most of the really innovative initiatives that I have seen succeed in government are generally championed by a single individual who has a vision, but they also have the very rare quality of being able to execute on that vision. Um, those kinds of decisions don't necessarily come from, you know, the or those kind of projects come from the electorate. It often comes from someone who has, you know, talked to someone in another jurisdiction or who has seen a problem firsthand and really has the, the will and the drive to make those changes. And that's not really helpful advice for someone who's outside and being like, try to find that person, but that person is probably out there. And it's just kind of being able to get in the room with that first person and to convince them that something needs to change, um, that can make all of the difference. That's great. And Peter Gunst has also joined us over here. Hi, Peter. And so folks, we've got a few more minutes here with Kristen. So get your questions in if you want them answered. She's got a lot of buying experience. What would you like to tell newcomers to the space if they're just starting in the law librarian space, in the project management and legal innovation, how would you, you know, fresh out of school and they're getting into this space, how would you advise them? So in terms of law librarians and knowledge managers, they're in some ways at a disadvantage because people often don't think of them, especially lawyers, they do their jobs and they're there. Uh, they don't, you know, they don't view them as making money for the firm, but that's actually a really big advantage for those kinds of people because no one actually knows what you do at the end of the day. So no one really knows where your skills start and end. So when a new project comes up, if you think you have any chance whatsoever of possibly being able to do it, like raise your hand and say, you know what, I want on this. Here's my skill set. I think I could contribute something. I'm happy to work a little extra to do that. And just starting to identify those opportunities where a librarian skill set or a knowledge manager skill set might actually be quite appropriate. That's cool. That's good advice. And how would you, is there communication within the firm that you think is helpful uh, in the firm or in the agency that you're working for that you do think is helpful? Things that have helped you in your, in your legal technology background? Uh, find the influencers in your organization and they're not always the, the partners or the head of the organization. They're often the receptionist, the office manager, people who work in facilities, people who work in IT. They see everything and they talk to everyone. And being able to make those kinds of connections that are often ignored, you will get a lot of information and a lot of insight and probably opportunities to identify issues and hopefully solutions that other people just aren't seeing. And the more you are able to have a holistic, you know, systems overview of your organization and understanding all the different moving pieces, um, I think the better you'll be. That's great, great, great suggestions. And uh, Amanda, what were you creating a form for? Or were you creating a form to help government, onboard government? Is that what you're getting at? 
yeah oh yeah she is <laughs> she she can create all kinds of forms faster than anyone i know um uh, christian please if you have another it sounds like you're in in the middle of selling so please ask some more questions it's the first time we've had you as a guest in here so i'm glad to have you Kristen, what do you need to tell? Where do people need to find you? What haven't we cut? Co- well, before we get to where people find you, what haven't we covered that you wish we would have covered tonight or you think we should cover? Um, I mean, I think, you know, we've covered uh, everything. I've, I've given my thoughts on Richard Suskin before, so we, we don't need to uh, rehash that. But uh, yeah, no, I, I think just having forums like this and on clubhouse and twitter and discord and wherever else i think is really great i think um particularly in the legal tech space there are a lot of people who are neurodivergent and they learn and communicate in very different ways and i think just being able to um have this kind of multimedia community is a really great thing and i hope to see more of it and i hope to see more people participate um you know i know that there are there are lots of egos on Twitter and there's lots of, you know, very important people on there, but there's you're, always, ref- you're referring to us, right? Uh, obviously we're, we're, we're super awesome people. Right. Okay, um, good, good. Yeah. I, I've never uh, been a cool kid before. Uh, so this, <laughs> apparently this is, I've reached the, you've reached the, the, the pin- coolness. If this, this is the, pin- if this is the pinnacle, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you're new, I like, there is space for you and if you don't feel like there is space like you know put up your elbows make some space and i think everyone who's been in this industry a while be mindful that there are younger people coming or people right out of school there are people switching industries take them under your wing mentor them introduce them to people invite them into your space um, and also listen to them because they probably have ideas that you haven't even thought of yeah so so basically be nice to people and be welcoming. It's, like it's literally not hard. It's, it's actually the easiest thing. It's not hard at all. Yeah, it's very simple. Okay, so where do people now find you uh, if they want to continue this conversation with you? I do not exist in real life. I only exist on the Twitters. So you can find me. It's just at Kristen Hodgins. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn, but mainly on Twitter. Um, I have started a Discord for the legal tech community. It is not really being used yet, but we have lots of subscribers. So if you have some ideas, if you wanna host some chats, or if you want the link to the Discord, let me know, I'd be happy to share it with you. Yeah, I was thinking about that the other day that we that you had created it and actually because we've used Discord for other things, but we have not uh, we have not yet Clubhouse. Used, yeah, yeah, Clubhouse came along. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, Mauricio Duarte says, uh, "Well, that Clubhouse group sounds awesome. I might need to join, and you should, Mauricio." Uh, there's plenty of space there to talk. And for people who do not like to be camera ready, uh, that seems to be one of the benefits of Clubhouse. Um, all right. So you can find Kristen Hodgins, who is our guest today for episode 102. You can find her on Twitter at Kristen, and that's K R I S T I N Hodgins, which is H O G. H-O-D-G-I-N-S. And so make sure it's not Kristen with an E. It's Kristen Mm-mm, with an I. Mm-mm. Do not like E's, no. <laughs> they also like process rather than process where <laughs> Kristen is from. So Love a process. Loves a process. And in the U.S., we like a process. So thank you, Kristen, for being a guest tonight. Thank you, everybody, for being here. You've had, uh, I, I have to tell you, you've had a huge uh, live audience uh, very big. They've been remote. They've been a bit quiet and Peter is also quiet, but I thank you for being here. I thank you for all you do in the legal tech community. I'm happy to call you a friend. Uh, I guess we can, we, should we tell that story? I feel like we should have that on audio, right? How, I've, yeah. Let's I tell mean, we've never really said that. Uh, you want to tell it, you tell it. You go ahead. You're, you're a good storyteller. <laughs> I'm not sure that's the case. <laughs> uh, yeah, we started a Zoom group back at the beginning of COVID. I think uh, I think we decided it was early March, uh, like uh, first or no, it was uh, yeah, it was mid March when we went into lockdowns, and I just made it open to anybody. 
And Kristen was one of those people who showed up, I think, at the first or second and then continued on from there. And that's continued on for weeks now or for months now during COVID. Uh, So uh, we have uh, become a pretty close knit group of friends as a result of COVID in Zoom. We have, and it's wild because I've only met one of the group in person before, but yet I count you among my very good friends and I talk to you more than I talk to my own family. (laughs) It's, it's been an interesting, interesting uh, experience for many of us, I think, but a good experience for helping us all to cope during this time. So I think that is worth at least having on the podcast for our posterity. And thank you, Sujish, for joining. Thank you, Mauricio, Ashley. Peter, Chris, uh, Christian, Amanda, thanks so much, everybody, for being here tonight. We will be back next week for episode 103 with several members of Lex Dow talking about uh, legal decentralized autonomous organizations. Show up. Uh, we will have it Zoom and on Facebook. And thanks again. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.